we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I do have to mention a few things. Uh, the first thing is that there are handouts. I didn't, was not able to finish them. So I will give them all to you guys within the week. Um, I really just finished putting the PowerPoint on just a couple minutes ago. Normally I'm much more prepared, but the week was very hectic. I was running around like crazy. And uh, so I didn't actually finish this. So I guess that's a good thing for both of us. I'm sure you guys are tired of giving up your Sunday nights. And I'm kind of tired of writing and doing the, all the extra work on for a Sunday night, huh? So <laughs> we both profit from the break. This is the last, uh, the last night of this. And I wanted to turn you into a book here. Uh, it's called Grasping God's Word. The basic outline of everything that we've looked at was derived from this book. Um, it was basically a combination of myself and itself. And uh, so if you want more in-depth stuff or you want to break it down slightly uh, different than I did, check out the book. Tonight we're going to look at the Old Testament. And... Uh, Please make do without having something to uh, fill in the gaps on, and I'll get it to you this, this week. Uh, the first uh, section of the Old Testament worth looking at is called stories. Um, technically, they're called narratives, but narrative just sounds so, I don't know, pompous, I guess. So I just changed it to stories. <laughs> um, much of the Old Testament is stories. You've got a good deal of Genesis, and uh, you know you go through like, half of Exodus, um, just a little bit of Leviticus, ha- about a half-ish of Numbers, uh, parts of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I mean, you get the, the Bible is a very historical book, and what I mean by that is it's got a lot of um, it, rec- it recorded a lot of events in it. Um, it the, the, the stories kind of range quite severely between you know the the well-loved stories that like everybody talks about and knows, and just almost like a part of the culture, uh, like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and that coined a whole phrase, which, you know, kind of uh, a big deal there. Um, who doesn't know the story of David and Goliath? I mean, these are things that are just a part of our culture. It's a part of the English language. But then you got some uh, some other stories in there that are kind of bizarre, maybe not really talked about a whole lot. Uh, there's this one story where a prophet uh, is called Baldy from a bunch of kids, and a bear comes out and eats them. And you're like, well, what's going on there? <laughs> Uh, there's another one where David uh, has to collect a, a bunch of foreskins uh, as a bridal price. And you know, what's going on there? And so there's a lot of bizarre stories in the Old Testament, but there's a lot of you know well-loved stories. And it has this wide range of stories, and uh, it's, it's a very very interesting thing. But the thing, th- there's two kind of aspects of all the biblical stories. The first is that the stories are historical. Um, they give a lot of details to events that we didn't have from other sources until recently. Uh, the Bible is very, uh, very informational, for instance, about the Babylonians. Well, there was a long period of history where people didn't even think that the Babylonians really existed. It was just something made up. <laughs> or you take the Philistines, who had no written records. Um, for this, I'm sure you've heard the term, oh, they're a Philistine, meaning they're uncivilized or you know, barbaric or so, such and such because they didn't have any written records. So a good deal of what we know from the Philistines is actually from the Bible. There's not something we can dig up because it doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, so, so the stories of the Old Testament are historical. Uh, the, the people oftentimes think when you, when you hear stories, they think more of uh, myth, like The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. But that's not really the idea here. We have real people in real situations in real places, places that actually exist. Uh, and as you, you know explore different ancient things, you, you find the same things kind of creeping up over and over again. Uh, typically, the Bible, when it makes a claim, has been proven true when it can be. There are many times when the Bible can't really be proven true because th- some things aren't really mm, provable. Um, you take, for instance, the Israelites in the wilderness. They were out there in the wilderness. They weren't like leaving wrappers or anything. There wasn't anything for them to leave behind for us to find. So it's not really going to be hard, kind of hard to prove that there are a bunch of people living in the desert. Not only that, but those there's desert storms through there that are crazy. I mean, they blow away everything, uh, cover everything else. Uh, the chances of us finding something that proves that they were there is just nearly impossible. Uh, there's so many sites, just the ones that we know about, which there's a lot of them out there that nobody knows about, just the ones that we know about. Very few of those have been excavated. And of those excavated... <laughs> 
they haven't been fully excavated. <laughs> so you have these people making these grand assumptions, assumptions on very limited knowledge. Um, very, very limited knowledge. Um, so there's really no leftovers in some cases. In some cases, uh, different records have been ruined. Um, most of the uh, Egyptian records, for instance, were written on what's called papy papyrus. It's paper, ancient paper, basically. Uh, and the northern parts of Egypt held the records of the papyrus. But guess where spent most of the time being flooded? <laughs> Northern Egypt. <laughs> and then you get to the uh, certain uh, historical events, such as the burning of the Library of Alexandria and different events like that, where a lot of records were just destroyed. So this is apart from time passing. So you got Napoleon Bonaparte going through there, and he kind of wrecked havoc too. And all these different things that happened. And, you know, there's a whole world of history that's happened, and it ruined a lot of records. Um, and, and so the idea is here that you can't, uh, th there's a healthy skepticism. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Well, that's worth investigating. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we don't want to stake our hope on something that could be a lie. That's worth investigating. But then there's an unhealthy skepticism. This is where it's uh, all-consuming, and you, no amount of evidence will ever prove it. Okay, like, well, how do you even know that Jesus existed? Well, apart from external sources and internal sources, and there's lots of different things there, uh, yeah, I guess nothing. I mean, you could just assume that Caesar didn't exist either. Hey, why even exist uh, that anybody has ever existed? See what I mean? There's a level of skepticism that's good, but then there's a level that's just kind of extreme. And uh, so beyond, uh, beyond reasonable doubt, we, can, we know that the Bible is, is, is historical. But it's not just historical. It's not just a history book. It's theological. The things that were recorded are recorded for a reason. It doesn't just tell us a bunch of t details about something that doesn't matter to our life. It specifically tells us some things about stuff that we need to know. Very important. If you read through Kings, for instance, it doesn't tell us a lot of the things that we would expect from a record of kings of Israel. Rather, it tells us things like their moral standing, sinful things that they did. But politically speaking, that's not all that important. And you have Bill Clinton, remember what he said? Does it really matter? Well, not that what he said, but the idea behind what he was saying. Does it really matter whether or not he slept with that woman or not? See what I mean? There's this whole idea behind it. Does morality uh, disqualify him from being a president? This is a whole big controversy that, that, that people were really struggling with. Well, in the book of Kings, once again, it's not just mentioning historical details. It's, it's, it's doing so for a reason. Um, so it, not every word in stories is as necessarily as significant as they were in the letters of the New Testament. So when you're reading the, the stories... Don't trip over every individual word used. Like, oh, I have to do a word study on every single word used. Not so much in the stories. In the stories, it's more trying to tell you the, uh, teach you something by means that you'll remember. Um, when you're when you're working through, uh, when you're working through the stories, you want to do the exact same thing like before. You you make you start off with step one by making observations, and you're working through it that way. And you're trying to see what, what the difference is, what the similarities are. That's all pretty much the same. Uh, one thing that's more uh, similar to the Gospels, but a little bit more involved, is that in the Gospels, the, the different events are kind of shorter, and they're next to each other, and you kind of see the flow uh, or themes that come out. Well, in the stories, it's usually a lot more drawn out than that. The, the stories are connected, but usually a lot longer and, 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 and interspaced. So you have, like, you know, something mentioned in, in, in Genesis 12 about Abraham, and then you get way down here to Genesis 30 and 40, and you're thinking, what does this have to do with that? You know what I mean? What, what's, the, what's the carrying over theme? And so you see, uh, Judges is a good example of this. So there's going to be some connections that are just kind of drug out. You know, so. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, there are three basic elements of every, uh, of every story. Uh, plot, setting, and character. So plot has three basic ideas. There's exposition. This is where it gives the setting of the story. Then there's a conflict. This is where... Um, it's going to, mm, something is going to be incomplete in some sense, and it's going to lead to a conflict. Okay, so this is, maybe a person has a deficit of character, maybe the situation isn't how it should be. It's going to cause a conflict somewhere, that's step two. Step three is resolution. Um, this is where the conflict is going to reach an ultimate climax, and then it's going to have resolution. 
Uh, you can find, kind of see that throughout the, throughout the story, the, the three parts of the plot. And so whenever you're reading through a story, try to break it up as much as you can into, into these three parts. Where is the exposition? Where is the conflict? Where is the resolution? Some of them are going to be easier. Uh, Job uh, doesn't have a whole lot of plot development. Right, so it has the beginning. It gives the exposition. What's going on? There's this righteous guy. He loses a bunch of stuff. Okay, all right. Well, then you have the conflict. Well, I guess you could say him losing the stuff is part of the conflict, and God not answering. And then it reaches an ultimate climax with God answering, but not in the way that Job was really expecting. And then you get the resolution of the story. So it's got those three parts. Um, usually, like in the Book of Genesis, you're going to see those three points kind of repeat themselves over and over again. Uh, Ruth is a shorter event, a shorter example. It tells us, okay, so there was this this event that happened in this place during the time of the judges. Oh, okay, and then it tells us what what the what the problem is. It gives us a conflict. Um, Ru, um, Ruth's mom's mother-in-law's husband dies. Ruth's husband dies, and Ruth's sister-in-law husband dies. So there's a conflict. And so the issue is, God has God abandoned us? <laughs> and then you get to the ultimate resolution where Boaz marries her, and she's taken care of, and she gets a child. So Next up is the setting. The setting isn't just about a, pl a place, like where does this happen, it's also when. Um, and it's interesting, once again, to, me to mention that the stories in the Bible, these are actual places. When we look at different records and, and accounts, they're there. They, they didn't just bring up some magical fairyland, like... Hey, down at the Lonely Mountain, there was a ring, and Bilbo Baggins found it. And like, no, you don't have that kind of a mythological thing. I mean, these are real places with real people. Uh, when it references Kings of Babylon, it talks about real people, people that we found from external sources. Um, I know people sometimes get kind of bothered by the fact that the Old Testament usually doesn't tell us what Pharaoh. That shouldn't really concern us. Pharaoh is more of a um, catch-all term. Uh, so you could talk about any number of pharaohs by calling them simply pharaoh. It's not something that makes it not historical. It's just something that actually kind of adds to the history. Um, <clears throat> so the time, these are kind of important, usually important. Uh, for instance, in the book of Ruth, when it tells us that this happened during the time of the judges, we know that that was a time of chaos when there wasn't good leadership, there wasn't good structure. Things were just kind of crazy. Uh, that's important to know because we can probably assume that widow, widows and widowers probably weren't real taken care of. <laughs> uh, so kind of an important part there. Uh, and then the second part of the setting is the place. Um, and the details often are important. Uh, for instance, uh, in the story of the, or, uh, this is a parable. This is, takes us to the New Testament, but it's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, there's this account where there's this man that's going from, I believe, Jericho to Jerusalem and uh, he's mugged, and a Samaritan saves him. Well, if you know the, the route that he took, it, it's got a lot of different, you know, um, blind corners on it and rocky areas, and it would be easy to get mugged. It's easy to imagine it. Um, of course, that's a parable, not a story, so it's a little bit different, but still. Uh, next up in, in a part of a story is the characters. Uh, this is basically the who, and we sometimes don't stop to really think about who are the characters of the story, why are they mentioned, and in what extent are they mentioned? But it is very important to stop there. Um, and the thing about the characters is they're they're not really flat. They are um, they're really in depth characters. It's just that they're not always elaborated on. I'll give you a good story, a good example. Um, David, King David, cheats on cheats with sleeping with his friend's wife. His friend's name is Uriah, so he commits adultery. And uh, Uriah's wife is named uh, Bathsheba, and so he sleeps with this guy's wife, and she gets pregnant. So now he's got a little bit of a problem. And so he uh, gets Uriah to come back from war, which is where David should have been, <laughs> and uh, tries to get him to go home and sleep with his wife so that he can say, ha-ha, it was your baby, ha, -ha. And um, it doesn't work because he sleeps out in the courtyard instead of going back to sleep with his wife. Uh, not even under the same house. And so David calls back and says, well, why didn't you go back and sleep in your house with your wife? Take it easy. And he makes a comment, why should I sleep and in, in, in sleep like that when my fellow Israelites aren't? Which kind of brings up a lot of questions. First off, is Uriah making a jab at King David for not being at war where he should have been? Did Uriah know that David and Bathsheba had cheated? Did he know that? The story doesn't really tell us. 
Have you ever heard of a little thing called court gossip? It's possible that he already knew. So you're left with this, and you and you put yourself in David's shoes. Oh, does he know? Things are getting a little hectic now. You know, so was was Uriah being on the level with what he said? Did he say, oh, no, I slept because why should I stay out here when my fellow Israelites are there? Or is he more of just making up an answer so David will leave him alone? We don't know. There's a lot of things like that in stories that aren't really elaborated on. So characters definitely are not flat. Um, and the, I think, if anything, we read them too quickly and we only give them the level of intel- intelligence that we would give uh, a simple uh, character on a B movie, you know. Uh, the next thing that's really important in, in stories is the viewpoint of the author. Are they being condemning? Are they being neutral? Uh, there's a story in Judges which the author never comments on. He re- simply records that there's this priest who goes and stays with this guy, and he's got a concubine, and there's a bunch of people who gather around outside, and they demand that he come out and, uh, well, basically that they can rape this this priest. And the the host goes out and, so, and says, no, 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 please don't do this. Almost exactly mirroring the event from Genesis of Sodom and Gomorrah. Almost exactly mirroring it. So in this one, though, the priest takes his own concubine. That's right, the priest has a concubine. And throws her outside. And the two guys stay inside while the concubine gets savagely raped. Savagely to the point that in the morning, she is dying on the steps. By the time that he opens the door, she's already dead. And he says, hurry up and get up. We've got to get out of here. Like, no sympathy whatsoever. After this woman was just abused all night long by a bunch of guys, no sympathy. And so then he takes her home and cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her throughout the, the regions of Israel. How jacked up is this? So obviously the character, I mean, the author of Judges isn't telling us anything of what he thinks about this, but he makes an indirect comment about it by, by, by setting it up just like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. His, his, his point is obvious. We have become just like them. That's the point. We are just like the Canaanites, just like the people that God sent us here to conquer. At the beginning of the book, they weren't willing to take that step and obey God, and at the end of the book, they're just like Canaanites. So you have this, he's saying something, but without saying it. And if you pay attention to those kinds of, kinds of details from the author, it's very important. I'll give you another one very quickly. In 1 First Kings 1-11, through 11, it's boasting about all of King Solomon's achievements, going on and on and on, saying about how great of a king he was. Uh, he had horses from Egypt. He has all this accumulated wealth. Uh, he marries uh, the, the Pharaoh's prince, or daughter, I mean, uh, he has all kinds of wives, and it's, it sounds like a good thing. Like, wow, this guy's done very good for himself. Except that if you read Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, it says very clearly when you, have, when you, when you go and get a king for yourself, because you're going to get tired of that, you're going to want to get a king. When that happens, don't accumulate wealth. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't have a bunch of wives. He goes like and with all these different things, and in Kings it shows step by step how Solomon did all those things that Deuteronomy said not to do. A fantastic example where it sounds like the author is commending Solomon, but when we get to the end of it, we see that he was actually um, criticizing him. Uh, and he even makes this comment, the Lord became angry with Solomon. So uh, we see a lot of uh, things there about v- the viewpoint of the author. Very important to, to mention that. So uh, some elements of stories that are... Uh, Definitely worth checking into. They're twofold. Uh, first is comparison and contrast. Uh, we've talked about this in other books. So I'm not going to really elaborate that much. But think of um, in First Samuel, it has this little thing that it does of comparing King David with King Saul. It kind of just lines them back and forth. And if you read through the book and you kind of see what it says about the two characters, you see very obviously what the points are. It, it introduces King Saul. He's this bumpkin out in, the, out in the country looking for a donkey. It's almost comical. He's out there just looking for a donkey. He can't find it. We, and then we switch over to King David later, and we find out that he is a shepherd. He's taking care of it, taking care of the bears and all these, all these predators that are coming. Versus Saul, who's out there wandering for something. You know, you have Saul, who, uh, who all constantly has chances to do right, but 
does wrong. <laughs> and you have David who constantly has chances to do wrong and does right. And if you go through, it, it kind of compares the different uh, characteristics of the two. And I don't really want to get too much into it, but um, I encourage you to look through, read through First Samuel and try to uh, highlight everything that, that, that gives a detail of David versus Saul. So, okay, next up is irony. Uh, we've already looked at that too. Um, but once again, uh, irony, the basic idea here is that surface meaning doesn't, is oftentimes different than the intended meaning. Um, a good example of this is Eli, there's a priest called Eli in 1 Samuel, and he has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And they decide to take the Ark of the Covenant with them into battle. And this sounds like a good thing. Ah, this is going to be the part of the story where everything changes. Well, then it turns out that they're both killed, and the Ark of the Covenant is taken. That would be a, 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 an, a, an example of irony in a story. It's not the thing that you're expecting to happen. And then they lose the Ark of the Covenant, and you think all is lost, only to have God defend himself against the Philistines by knocking the idol of Dagon over. So you have like this whole story from start to finish is completely ironic, not what you're expecting at all. Uh, and when you're looking through stories in the Old Testament, start with this. How do the episodes fit the whole book? What does this episode have to do with the whole book? Uh, Genesis, the summary of Genesis is this. God takes chaotic things and brings it to order. You see him do it with, you see him do it with creation. You see him do it with Israel's sons. You see, you see him do it with Abraham. Throughout the whole book, you constantly see him taking these chaotic things that have no meaning and everything's falling apart and bring order from them and bring clarity from them and bring purpose from them. And Joseph even makes a comment that basically summarizes the whole book of Genesis. He says, what you intended for evil, God turned for good. And that's the entire summary of Genesis. He, he literally summarizes the entire book with that sentence. And uh, So how do these episodes fit into the whole book? Um, another, qu- another way you can look at that is, how do the books fit together? Here are some, a couple examples. The books of the law, they're all connected. They're all their own thing, but they're all connected. So when you start in Leviticus and it says, God said, you know that the setting is from Exodus, where they're at Mount Sinai. Um, and then... Uh, when you compare numbers with Exodus, you'll remember in Exodus how Israel was, Egypt was struck with the plagues of, Egypt, of Israel. Then you get to numbers and you see Israel is struck with the plagues of God. So you have like this contrast between Israel and Egypt and how both of them have, have gone astray. Um, some other examples, Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah picks up right where Ezra pick, stops. Uh, Joshua and Deuteronomy. J- Deuteronomy is like a, a refresher on the law, and Joshua goes with the basis of Deuteronomy and just kind of plows forward from there. You can read them back to back, and you kind of get the full idea. Um, so when you're looking for context, we've, lo- we've talked a lot about looking for, con- looking for context in the stories. When you are looking for, for a context, how far do you go? There's four basic steps that I think will help. First off, how does this event fit the Old Testament? That's step one. Step two, what is the summary of the book that, that this event is in? What's a, what, what's, for instance, let's say you're looking into a story from Genesis. What's the summary of Genesis? What is Genesis as a whole about? And so then how does that story fit into that? Uh, step three, read the chapter before and after and understand how it fits in the larger flow. So, you know, get, you know, I'm reading this part. I want to know what it means. So read the chapters around it, before and after. And then the fourth thing, the last thing to do, read the entire larger episode and see how it fits. So you're trying to find out about some story and judges that doesn't make sense. Well, kind of get an idea for the flow here. What, what, is, what is the entire passage about? You can read, in, read about Samson taking the, taking the skull and killing some people with it. Well, what's the entire story of Samson? Like, how does that fit into that? <coughs> Uh, when you're reading stories, there are some key things to look out for. The first thing, good guys aren't always obvious. Uh, sometimes they're doing the wrong things. Sometimes it, 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 there's just a lot of complexity there. And we've kind of looked at some of those things. But the idea here is that we don't mirror everything about them, right? So we looked at this morning in the sermon, we looked at Lot. And it was it's good to mirror some things about him, the way that he was trying to do the right thing. But it might not have been the best thing to mirror other things about him. For instance, if he was actually, if he actually was abandoning his daughters, well, we would want to repeat that. But we would want to repeat the part about trying to do the right thing. Uh, so, um, uh, then sometimes people are called righteous, but it's more of an aspect that is righteous. For instance, Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land because he rebelled against God. 
However, he is still a good example of being faithful in leadership. So uh, just because it's a good guy doesn't mean that they always do the right thing. Um, and they're not always easy to tell who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. Um, uh, good guys often also have a lot of bad to them. We've looked at a lot of examples before, but I'll mention them again. Gideon, who you know saved Israel, but then also erected idols. Uh, Samson, who saved Israel, but also worshipped himself. <laughs> Solomon, who brought pr- prosperity to the kingdom, but also disobeyed the law. Uh, God is often hidden in the stories of the Old Testament, or, or silent, hidden or silent. Throughout most of Job, God is, God is silent. I mean, he's not silent in heaven, but he's hi- silent to Job. Uh, in the book of Esther, God is not even mentioned one single time. Nowhere in the book of Esther is God there. But yet, he's behind the events. What are the chances of all those things working out like that? So, he's there, but sometimes hidden or silent. Uh, Which brings us to another another idea. God is uh, one of the main characters, if not the main character, in most of the stories. Um, He's not always the main character, but he is definitely one of uh, the foundational characters, I guess you could say, um, throughout the story. For instance, Esther is more focused on People who have to make a choice of (sighs) let's do what we can with what we have. Regardless of whether God's going to intervene or not, let's let's try and do the right thing. So even though God is a a character in Esther, he's not even brought up. He's not the main character of Esther. In Esther, the focus is on people. You have a choice. You can do the right thing or you can wait for somebody else to do the right thing. That's kind of the whole idea there. Um, So... um, God will oftentimes not be who you want him to be. There's this part in the law, for instance, where, where God says, tells Moses, this, he says, let me be, go away, I'm going to kill all of the Israelites. I'm going to wipe them out. You're just going to start the whole thing over with you and your wife. Don't even worry about it, I'm just going to kill them all. And so Moses pleads and begs, he says, please God, don't do this. Please don't do this. And he actually convinces God not to do it. That's a good example of God isn't always who you want him to be in the story, and you have to step back and let God be God. God's not God because he acts how we want him to or because we emotionally agree with him. He's God because that's who he is. So he is personal, but he doesn't conform to us. Um, and another example of something that we don't always expect is there's a story in, in Kings where it mentions that, um, I think this is the second Kings, uh, it says that God sent lying spirits to the prophets. God did it, not Satan did it. God sent the light, flying spirits. These are important details. It shows us things about God, but sometimes we don't like what we see, and so we just kind of ignore those parts of Scripture. And that's, I think, a mistake, uh, because God is, is more of a complex character than we sometimes attribute to him. Sometimes we think that he's just a real simple and basic character. And uh, so, okay, that digs us to the laws. Uh I, I wish I could go more in depth about the law, but honestly, you could turn studying the law into a six-week course all by itself, if not more, and so we're not going to do that. Um, typically, when Christians nowadays read the law, they do a couple things. First off, they try to live by the law, or they simply pick obvious ones and ignore the rest. So, okay, this law makes sense, so I'm going to follow it, but this one I'm not. Um, another thing that Christians historically have done is they've separated the law into kind of three categories. They say there's moral laws, civil laws, and ceremonial laws. Moral laws are things like love your neighbor. Civil laws are things like, hey, every seven years you cancel debts. And ceremonial laws are things like, hey, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And then they say that the moral laws are still laws. They still apply to us. But the civil and ceremonial, they're outmoded and they're just pushed away. But there's numerous problems. And I'm going to mention probably two, I think. Um, first off, many of the laws fit into numerous categories between moral, civil, and, and, uh, and um, uh, ceremonial. And, uh, for instance, there's a story that tells about how you test your wife for adultery. Well, is that a moral law, or is it a civil law, or is it a ceremonial law? It kind of fits into numerous categories. And uh, so then the next thing is that the Bible itself does not offer any separation between the types of laws. It gives them all as a united clump whole. And... uh, um, the, the third thing, the, so there is three things. The third thing is that all the law is theological, the entire thing. Moral, civil, ceremonial, ceremonial it was all given as, um, as uh, theology. Uh, so we're going to look at a few things about the law that I think might help. The first off, the law is a part of Israel's history. When you're reading about 
the plagues of Egypt, that is just as historically important as reading about the laws is historic. It's tied to Israel's history. Um, the context of the law is history, and vice versa, the history is the context of the law. Um, the law oftentimes will condemn the patriarchs. Uh, it'll say, thing, say things like, hey, don't, and for instance, the law specifically says this, do not marry a wife and her sister, or a woman and her sister. The patriarchs did that. And that's just one example. So, you know, it goes throughout, throughout and a lot of times you'll find uh, the patriarchs being condemned by the same law that would come through Moses. So, um, remember that as you're going, the giving of the Ten Commandments is listed in the exact same book as Israel's exodus from Egypt. So, uh, the law was a covenant made with Israel um, that they agreed to. It wasn't something they were forced into. And uh, basically, God says, I'm going to be in your midst, and these are the terms and conditions. So the law was part of God's terms, and, or was God's terms and conditions. And then you get, that's uh, Exodus through, through Numbers, but then you get to Deuteronomy, which is basically a renewal of the covenant. Um, you know, they're getting ready to go, and it's the next generation, so he's uh, once again kind of restating things. And it's strongly connected with the book of Joshua. There are five things in the law that I, I th I'm going to call considerations, things you need to consider whenever you're reading the law. Number one, the law is connected with the conquest of the land. It is not to be taken out of that context. The context of the law being given is in context of the of the of, of, of the con in context of the conquest. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so when you're when you're looking at the laws, you have to remember that this is a this is a very important thing. Israel no longer should follow the law of Moses. Jews should no longer follow the law of Moses. Christians should no longer follow the law of Moses. It was, it was part of a context. That context is over. Saying off, uh, the laws, the blessings of the law were conditional. It's not, I will do this, end of story. It's, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. Uh, Israel misunderstood that as well, and they ended up in exile for it. The third thing to remember about the law, the law is no longer functional. It's no longer functional. The blood of animals didn't even bring forgiveness of sins back then. How much more so since Jesus has come? So then the fourth thing about the law, the, the law no longer applies to us as law. This is very important to remember because Timothy, for instance, says, all scripture is God-breathed and you know, profitable for, for a proof and correction and encouragement, all these good things, okay? The, yes, so the entire law, the entire Bible, we can still learn from. However, it is no longer binding over as a, as a law. It's not even binding to the Jews anymore. The Jews, if they continue to follow Judaism, are following dead traditions that will not bring them any reconciliation to God. This is very important to remember because the Bible is very clear that salvation comes through Jesus for Jews and Gentiles alike. So and the fifth thing about the law, the law must be seen through New Testament eyes or through a lens of the New Testament. Um, so as you're going through it, it's not that it no longer applies. Okay, It has principles and lessons that apply, but it isn't a standard of how things should be. You can't look at the law and say, this is the golden standard for how things should be in the world. No, it's not. It wasn't even a golden standard back then. It was just a guide to act for a time. And as people sinned in one aspect of the law, they sinned in the whole of the law and proved their need for a Savior. So uh, there's a lot more that could s be said about that, but we'll move on from there. That takes us to verse Matthew 5.17, which is oftentimes, I think, misunderstood. It says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. People read this and they say, Okay, that means Jesus in no way removes the requirements of the law. That's, that's not what he said. Um, first off, he mentions the law and the prophets. Now, this is a, this is a catch-all term that is used in the, in the New Testament and elsewhere, um, but it basically means the Old Testament as a whole, everything in the Old Testament. Um, and the, the, what he's contrasting here, he doesn't say abolish or observe. Don't think that I came to abolish the law but to observe it. He says, don't think I came to abolish the law but to fulfill it. Um, and so the idea here is that he didn't come to put away the righteous demands, which would be to abolish it, but rather to fulfill them. He came to, uh, he came and he lived as a Jew under the law, and then in his death he fulfilled what the entire Old Testament was pointing towards. He fulfilled its ultimate purpose in being given. 
that does not mean that the, that the law is still somehow over us. Um, in fact, Galatians in many numerous parts goes to great lengths to talk about how we're no longer bound to that. We're, we're free from it now. Now, I think confusion over the law is probably the single uh, biggest debate for Christians who actually read the Bible. And the idea here is that Jesus brought the intended conclusion of the law. Um, the Old Testament prophesied of Jesus, not just with words, but also with intent. This is the intent, and in that Jesus fulfilled that intent. Um, and Jesus is the final interpreter of the, New Te- I mean, of the law, which basically means that he oftentimes um, changed laws, uh, made them more severe or less severe, uh, you know, all kinds of different things like that, ignored them all together. And the idea that I'm getting, I'm getting with, with here is, since Jesus is the final interpreter of the law, that should cause us to reinterpret the law in light of him. For instance, when I look at the seven, uh, sabbatical year, I have a new way to look at it in light of Jesus coming glory, the Christian life. There's a lot of different things like that. Um, okay, so the best model for the law, if you want to know how it applies to your life, is to just stick with the interpretive journey. Just do that. You start w- with, with, with the verse itself. Let's say, for instance, the part where it says, you know, do not trim the edges of your beard. Okay? And then you kind of look at it in context, and you find out that that, that that law is actually talking about a practice that they did to worship pagan gods. Okay? So what's the difference between them and them, and them there and us here? Well, we are not under the law. We're not Jews. We're not, we're not in the Holy Land and all that kind of stuff. Well, okay, so what's similar? Well, God still doesn't want his people to worship other gods. <laughs> so what's the principle here? Don't worship other gods. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how does this apply to my life? Make sure that God's first in all things. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good application. So that, that's just a real quick download of how it, how it does. Don't try to look for these real quick um, and easy solutions. Oftentimes you're just going to have to read it, study it, go through the interpretive journey. Um, and remember, always remember when you're looking at the law, what does the New Testament change about this? Very important. Very important. Um, like I said, I really, really wish we could look more at that, but we just don't have the time. Um, any questions about the law before I go on? No? Okay. So we're all understanding that we don't, the law doesn't apply to us, but it still has things to teach us and, and correct us and, and that kind of stuff, right? So there's principles there that we learn from and change us, but we're not bound like the Jews were. You know, I understand that, right? We're not going to offer goats <laughs> or bulls. <laughs> We're not going to avoid trimming the edges of our beards, <laughs> right? <laughs> we all understand this, right? Okay, all right. Uh, because this is something that you're going to run into when you talk to people of the world, atheists and whatnot. They're going to say, well, how come you follow some laws and you don't follow other laws? Very easy answer there. I don't follow any of the law. <laughs> I am free from the law. Jesus came. And so then you get into the whole conversation of the law of Christ, which is a good conversation to have. Um, so next up, uh, there, there are two more, three more sections of the Old Testament, poetry, wisdom, and prophets. First uh, off, poetry. Uh, the poetry is not just psalms. We think of psalms, but it's more than that. There's Song of Songs, Lamentations, a bunch of the prophets, stuff like that. Uh, and, and the good thing is about poetry like psalms is it tells us it's okay to cry out to God and it's okay to not be okay. That's a very important thing. Sometimes we're, we're taught, especially in Christian circles, you have to have it all together all the time. The poetry kind of freezes of that. Um, now, things in Psalms aren't necessarily right. They're just emotional expressions. Okay? So, like, for instance, in Psalm 138, it says, Oh, that somebody would take their children and throw them up against the rocks and dash them to pieces. Oh, my. Well, that's how he genuinely felt because they'd gone through the exile. The Babylonians had killed their kids. And now here they were in exile, away from their people, and away from their land, away from their culture. And then the Babylonians said, Hey, come and sing us a song. Oh, I'll sing you a song, buddy. You can just hear his his upset tone throughout the whole thing, and and that's that's fine. It's 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 a it's a good example of crying out to God. Um, poetry like Psalms are not written to be like Romans. Like you get through Romans, right? And it's very logical. It goes from point to point. He has his very well organized on this very logical book. But then you get to Psalms, and it's a very emotional book. Poetry is meant to be more emotional. It's not meant to uh, tug at your head. It's meant to tug at your heart. There are three elements of poetry. The first is that poetry is terse. The second is that poetry is um, 
has structure, and the third is that poetry has figurative language. We're going to look at that a little bit by little bit. First, poetry is terse. What that means is it uses very few words to make, but very impactful words. Psalm 25, 4 says, Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. In Hebrew, line one has three words. In Hebrew, line two has two words. This entire verse has five Hebrew words. It's pretty cool. Uh, you can see the example of being very, very terse. Um, structure is a lot of things that we've looked at, different kinds of parallelism and acrostics. Uh, we'll look at the parallelism, parallelism first, though. Um, and if you'll remember, parallelism, parallelism is two or more lines that, together that elaborate a point. So Psalm 3, 1 through 2, Lord, how many foes increase? He's going to repeat it again. Many who attack me, that would be the foes. Many say about me, that would be the foes. There is no help for him in God, that would be the foes. So you have four different lines that all are talking about the foes. Um, Psalm 2, 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord ridicules him. The Lord is the one enthroned. Uh, Lord, my Lord, my strong Savior, you shield my head on the day of battle. It's, these two lines are just a, more elaborating on um, who the strong Savior is. Uh, he will not allow your foot to slip, your protector will not slumber. Those two thoughts are connected. Um, so, <clears throat> that takes us to... Uh, Hold on, let me make sure. I, oh, yeah, I wanted to mention the acrostics. Acrostics are basically lines that go through the alphabet. So if you read through Psalm 119, you're going to find it's going to be broken up into a series of eight verses. There's going to be Aleph, Beth, Gamil, and you go on down through it. Each one's going to have one of those headers on it. And the idea is that in those series of eights, so like Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew, Hebrew um, uh, alphabet. And so each line in Aleph in Psalm 119 is going to be start with Aleph, the letter Aleph. And so you get through, and you get to Beth. And the ne those next four, four verses, or I'm sorry, eight verses, they're all going to start with Beth as well. Now, that doesn't come across in English, but in Hebrew is written as poetry. Um, so, you know, and acrostics are like that. Lamentations, chapters one through four, all of them are acrostics. They all go through the alphabet like that. Um, so if you still look at what acrostic is, it would be like me seeing this. A wonderful day is today. Because we're here at church together. Can you think of another line? Don't you dare stop listening. You see, it's A, B, C. Are you seeing? It's, it's, so that's kind of the idea of a acrostic. It's a little bit maybe unfamiliar, but once you kind of get the idea, it's kind of more easier. Then the third uh, element of poetry is figurative language. Uh, this is non-literal words that paint a picture. Okay. Um, they're very culture-specific. If you've ever learned multiple languages, you know how, how persnickety figurative language can be. Think of a student who talks about a, a, a test that they took and how that te the, the teacher is a psycho and they're, and they're afraid that they're going to bomb the test. Right? But then if you were an uh, a English a second language student and you, heard, you, hear, you don't know the figur figurative language and you hear the student talking about the teacher being a psycho and bombing, you're wondering, what in the world do bombs have to do with the test? And is psycho, does that mean psycho, psycho, hold on, are you saying these unstable? Are teachers mentally unstable? See, they're, they're figurative languages that, that we understand because this is our culture. But in other places, they didn't have those. Um, and just like in, in Hebrew, there's going to be some things that, they, that don't really travel over very well uh, to English. Um, but there are literal aspects of even the most figurative of languages. In the case of that student, there was an actual literal test. Um, that, that is something that stays the same. So uh, th there, are, uh, there, there, are, there are various figurative languages. Um, the ones we're going to specifically mention, analogies, substitutions, apostrophe, irony, wordplay. So let's just kind of go through them because you're not going to remember all those different things. Um, I'll just kind of tell you what they are. The first one is, uh, is called... <coughs> It's not called, mm -hmm, it's called analogies. Proverbs 11:22. a beautiful woman who rejects good sense is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. It's, it's an analogy. It's drawing, drawing an idea here. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He pulled me out of deep waters. We're not literally talking that I was in the ocean, right? We're talking more metaphorical. He pulled me out of, of deep waters. Okay. Uh, my tears have been my food day and night. Well, that's just gross. <laughs> you don't eat your tears, silly. Uh, but, you know, it's more, once again, poetical language. He's talking about something that, that um, he's, he's, he's depressed. That's a good way of saying that. Psalm 40, er, no, sorry, 91.4. He will cover you with his feathers. He will take refuge under his wings. Obviously, God doesn't have feathers and wings, obviously. 
Um, 44, 23 from Isaiah. Rejoice, heavens, for the Lord has acted. He's, he's, he's calling on something to do something. Rejoice, heavens, for the Lord has shout depths of the earth. Break out into singing mountains. He's talking to things that don't can't really do these things. They're inanimate objects. Um, but uh, it's, a good, it's just a good example of, of um, analogies. So then there's what's called substitutions. Let me hear joy and gladness. There would be the, the equivalent of this would be like you, you're yelling at a, at a baseball game to the batter, make me happy, make me happy. Well, what do you mean? You mean get a home run. It's, it's, you're using uh, poet, poetical talk like substitutions, and it's the same thing here. Let me hear joy and gladness. Well, what's the idea? He messed up with Bathsheba. David messed up with Bathsheba. He's calling out to God to forgive him. And in that, he says this line, let me hear joy and gladness. What is he saying? He's saying, kill me, forgive me. Let's move on from this. I, I don't want to be under this weight of guilt for forever. I want to I wanna move on with my life. I want things to be normal again. I want them to be better again. Proverbs 19.13, a foolish son is his father's ruin, and a wife's nagging is an endless dripping. The idea here, let's kind of focus on the first line instead of the nagging wife. Huh? Uh, a foolish son is his father's ruin. Well, because he's foolish? No, because foolish sons do things that make fathers upset. <laughs> You get what I mean? <laughs> so it, it's more, a, and a way of talking about uh, substitutions is think of, it's emphasizing the consequence of the thing. So a foolish son is his father's ruin. Instead of saying, a son who gets himself into debt, steals from his father, sleeps around, has babies all over town, makes his father very upset. No, he just says, no, a foolish son makes his father, uh, brings his father ruin. So um, some other examples of how substitutions can happen, especially in the prophets, you're going to find that he says something like this. Jerusalem, and it's going to be, Jerusalem isn't going to be talking about a city, it's going to be talking about Israel. And he's going to say Jerusalem is a symbol of all of, of Jerusalem. Like, think of this, uh, Washington and Tokyo were in talks today. Buildings of two cities were talking together? Well, no, no, Washington, D.C., so America, the American government, and Tokyo, the Japanese government, were talking together today. Okay, all right, so that's a little bit different. And it's the exact same idea as back, back then. Uh, Psalm 27 says, Some take pride in chariots and others in horses, but we take pride in the name of the Lord our God. The idea isn't the horses or the chariots. The idea is military strength or God. Are you going to trust the military or are you going to trust God? And uh, that's really the, the idea there. Apostrophe is something that I had never really heard of <laughs> before. <laughs> uh, it's basically addressing those that are not present, as, a, as simple of a definition as I could make of it. Psalm 114.5, why was it sea that you fled? Jordan that you turned back. He's not literally standing at the sea and saying, hey, why didn't you do this? It's, he's addressing something that's not, uh, not really there. Uh, 42.5 does the exact same thing. Why am I soul? Are you, he's not talking to his soul like standing outside of his body or something. He's talking you know, to his soul, uh, something that's not really here. Uh, irony is, is something we already looked at a couple weeks ago. Uh, Amos 4.4 4 kind of highlights that. This is God talking. Come to Bethel and rebel. Rebel even more at Gilgal. Hey, God tells us this then. This is fun. And then you go on and bring your sacrifices every morning, your tents every three days. Or tithes. Tithes every, or tents actually in this conversation. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Job is another good example of irony. You're expecting God to show up and say this one thing, but then instead he comes up and says, Tell me, Job, how does this work, and how does this work, and how does this work? How many stars are there? Tell me about the mysteries of the depths of the ocean. Tell me about all these creatures that you know nothing about. I, I, tell me if you know. No, actually, he doesn't say it like that. He says it like this. Tell me since you know. So obviously, that's, that's irony. Obviously, Job doesn't know, and uh, the point is very poignant. Uh, hey, if, if you don't understand even these great mysteries, what makes you think that you know all the mysteries of how I work and why I work? Um, so, Okay. <clears throat> uh, the last one I want to mention is, is wordplay. Um, there, there's a quote that I thought was a perfect example of wordplay. Let us all hang together or else we may hang separately. As supposedly Benjamin Franklin said that when after they signed the uh, Constitution. Uh, and the idea here of a wordplay is words that uh, either sound similar or are spelled similar or, or something like that where they're going to kind of carry over. Jeremiah 3.22 has a great example of wordplay. In your in your English, it's going to say, "Return, you faithless children! I will heal your unfaithfulness." But in Hebrew, it's actually a series of word plays that reads something more or less like this: "Turn, sons of turning! I will cure your turning." It's just a little. Uh, almost, you can almost picture Jeremiah laughing while he's writing. Ha ha ha! And uh, so, how you would translate that into more understandable English is, "Return, you faithless children! I will heal your unfaithfulness or your backsliding." 
Um, either or would work. Uh, and so when you're, whenever you're looking at poetry and figurative language, there's a few things. First off, slow down. Just slow down. And ask very basic questions, which I think oftentimes in the Bible we don't. Why did it say it like that? What does that actually mean? When you're reading through poetry, uh, po Psalms, ask that. Why did it say like that, and what does that actually mean? Uh, so you find the figures of speech, and, and wherever it is that you're reading poetry, you find the figures of speech. You visualize and imagine it, let your mind kind of absorb it fully. And then the third step is you summarize it. What is this saying? Let me just give a real summary of this. And uh, so Psalms doesn't primarily teach doctrine. When you're reading through Psalms, if, you, if you're looking for it to teach doctrine heavily, you're going to be very discouraged because uh, it's not. And then you can take it to some verses like that verse I mentioned in Psalm 138 where he says, talking about dashing babies to the ground, where you're going to be at a little bit of a loss as to what does this actually mean. I don't understand how I can rectify this. Well, obviously the Bible isn't telling us to go smash babies into the ground. Uh, it's, it's, it's not teaching doctrine primarily. It's showing examples of talking to God. And, uh, I mean, look at Job. He says all these things, and God, uh, God, at the very end of the book, God judges Job's friends, but doesn't say a word against Job, even though he was shooting off his mouth a whole bunch. See, God, uh, it, God knows what you're thinking anyways. You might as well pray. I mean, that's the only. That's the simplest way I can I can say that. But Job, but Psalms also teaches us meditation. You know, not New Age meditation like um, but meditation like fixing our thoughts on God's ways. Uh, and the Psalms also point to Christ. Uh, very very interesting. But remember uh, that poetry is all throughout the Bible. Now that takes us to the prophets. A lot of times people don't read prophets because they're scared or or whatever. They don't see how it applies. And I understandable. We don't really have a good uh, modern day equivalent for the prophets, but um, the prophets have a lot of verses that are very well loved and memorized. I mean, think about the all-time classic, uh, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength like eagles. They were sore, you know, all this. Uh, very, very good. Very, very, very good memorable lines that, that we all love. Well, those are from the prophets. And um, that, that one that people always quote, for I know the plans that I have for you, Jeremiah. These are These are much loved verses, but oftentimes I think that the prophets are kind of just ignored. Um, there are, the prophets are broken up, there's uh, 16 prophets are broken up into two sections, there's major prophets and minor prophets, major prophets, there's four of them, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and I'm missing one, Ezekiel, and these four are longer books, and they take over a longer span of time, then there's the 12 minor prophets, they're much shorter, uh, and they, they don't go through as long as time, here's the thing, okay, first off, Prophet in the prophecy, there's less than one percent that still has to come. Less than one percent. The grand majority of the prophets have already have already happened. Um, Jesus fulfilled some three hundred and something already, and uh, obviously more are set to be fulfilled. <laughs> um, uses a lot of figures of figures of speech and poetry in, in in the prophets. So if you understand the poetry bit, you'll understand that. I have handouts for all of this, so. Uh, uh, when you look at that, you're going to want to read through them. It'll help you in reading that. Uh, the prophets didn't always understand the things that they were prophesying. They weren't God. They were just the mouthpiece. Uh, they had, the prophecies also oftentimes had multiple fulfillments or stages. Um, we see that happen where something will happen, but then something else, part of it will ha won't happen for years later. Um, Isaiah has a one part where he's talking about how his son... Um, how there's going to be his son born to the virgin, which full was fulfilled when his wife gave birth because she had been a virgin and then she gave birth. But it was a bigger fulfillment that came, and that came hundreds of years later with Jesus. Um, so it, 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 it's easier to understand the prophets if you know history. Um, but since there's so few comparisons to modern writings, it's kind of hard to understand it either way. Uh, the only thing I can think of as a modern-day example is Bob Dylan's The Times They Are Changing. <laughs> You guys remember that song? You better start swimming or you'll stink like a stone. He addresses the he addresses parents. He addresses leaders, and that's very similar to how the prophets work, um, but not exactly. Still, maybe if that helps you, then it helps you. Uh, the The prophets are largely an anthologies. Don't look for them to be like a book written like you would write a book. They're a collection of, of prophecies. Uh, they're oftentimes not chron chronological. Jeremiah, for instance, really hops back and forth a lot. 
Uh, and uh, they are sometimes in themes, but not always in themes. Uh, the prophets did two things, foretell and forthtell. So the difference b- being um, foretell would be telling the future, forthtell would be telling a message from God or a truth. Um, and a lot of the prophets were, were kind of focused on the idea of why has God reneged on his agreement with us? Well, what's wrong? And the, and, and the prophets were kind of explaining that. Um, so they, they were giving God's message. It's just equally a part of, of what they did. Um, because they were asking, if we are God's people, then, why, then, then he, he won't abandon us. So why is, this, is he not real? Um, it, it is easier to understand the prophets. And in fact, I'll say this first off. If you are reading the prophets and you are having a hard time understanding that, it's easier if you're familiar with the rest of the Bible, historically speaking. Um, and I would recommend that if you're having problems reading the prophets, just start reading it. It'll be hit or miss at first. It'll be a lot of hit or miss at first. But the more you read it, you'll get some things, clarity on some things. But it's just like learning a language, right? So you go through this time, and you kind of hit this fog, and it's hard to understand. But you keep studying, and you keep learning the language. And eventually, the fog moves with you, and you understand things you didn't. It's the same thing as with the prophets. You start reading it. There's a lot of fog, a lot of things you don't understand. You keep reading, and some things become clearer, and some things you just got to keep going before it gets clearer. Get used to the idea of having questions when you're reading the Bible. And that's good. It's healthy, all that. Um, the prophets largely uh, uh, were written to God's people, not entirely to God's people, but largely to God's people. Um, and there are three, there, there's kind of a three-step process in the, in, in the prophets. We see it over and over again. Step number one, you broke the covenant, repent. Step number two, if you're not going to repent, there's going to be judgment. Step number three, there's hope after the judgment. And those are just a real quick summary um, obviously, it's hard to really limit anything to such a limited focus, but once again, I'm just trying to help you get the main flow of the book, or books, I should say. The biggest offenses that were listed in the uh, prophets might be surprising to some. Uh, it was basically twofold, um, idolatry and injustice. Um, people were worshiping other gods, and they were mistreating others. Huge fo- a hu- huge shift from uh, the pagan prophets. Um, they were also real focused on heartless traditions that they just did, like um, in Amos, for instance, we just read that, where he's saying, okay, go ahead and offer your tithe uh, while you go on to sin. <laughs> like it's just, like you, you can hear the sarcasm in God's voice. Um, the prophets, I think people think about prophets a lot differently than they are. They're oftentimes pleading for a change, really begging people to, to repent and change. They dealt with a lot of hard-heartedness, and they, they, it, it bothered them. Um, we think of people yelling with ragged clothes on, but that's not always necessarily the, the case. Um, we see in the Bible examples of people who really cared, uh, who were genuine people, who struggled themselves. I mean, you think of Habakkuk, who was struggling with how God was dealing with the situation. He didn't like how God was dealing with the situation. You have Jonah, who wanted to go the other way. You had Jeremiah, who didn't even want to prophesy anymore. He wanted to just be quiet and go away. See what I mean? Like, and so you hit all these different prophets. You don't have these people yelling in the Walmart parking lot. You have these people who are giving messages from God, even if they don't really want to. You have Amos, who wasn't even a prophet. He was uh, a tender of trees. And, and then God called him to go to Israel when he lived in Judah and give them a message that he didn't even want to give them. And then they didn't want him to give them the message either. They said, go back to Judah and tend to your whatever nonsense you got going on down there. Uh, and and so obviously there's a, a conflict there. And I don't think anybody would choose that kind of life. Um, and one thing we see in the prophets is that God doesn't find joy in the death of the wicked. This isn't something he thinks, hooray, I get to kill another sinner. Um, and I think sometimes, in, especially among Christian circles, we kind of get that idea that he's just waiting to wipe out the sinful. And that's not really the image that the prophet shows of God. Um, keep Jesus in mind whenever you're reading prophecies. Uh, things definitely um, either point to him or sometimes are changed by him. So always keep that in mind. In prophecy, you're going to see some things that did not come true. Okay, let me explain why. Prophecy, in, in prophecy, it talks about punishment as a result. But the punishment could change if the situation changes. For instance, in the book of Jonah, this, this, is, this is Jonah's words. In 40 days, you'll be destroyed. We get to the end of the book, that doesn't happen. The prophecy that God sent Jonah to give does not happen. Why did it not happen? Because the situation had changed. They were living in sin. He was going to destroy them. They repented. He changed his mind. The situation changed. Uh, Ezekiel talks about this over and over again. If somebody does a good thing, 
but then they turn from that good thing and turn to bad, then I'm going to punish them for that. I'm not going to remember this. But if somebody was doing a, good, uh, doing a bad thing and they turn and they turn to good, then I'm going to remember them for this. I'm going to wipe out this. So, and you have this, this whole, con- this whole uh, explanation that God gives in Ezekiel. It's definitely worth keeping in mind uh, because that is the case. Some prophecies did not come true, and it doesn't mean that God's a liar. It means the situation changed. Uh, when you're reading through the prophets, some things are going to be hard to figure out if it's literal or not. Um, just stick with it and keep studying. Um, you continue through the struggle. You're not always going to get all the answers. When it says that the lion is going to li- lie down with the lamb, does that mean animals specifically, or does it mean peace generally? Or are the, is the lion and the lamb a metaphor, and it's talking about the different nations? Or is it talking about, as some universalists would say, that pagans and Christians both are going to be saved in the end? See what I mean? So you have to kind of look at it and say, well, what's the context? And kind of try and pay attention to, well, what is the author trying to get across to his original audience? And that'll help you. But there's still going to be situations where you're going to go to it and say, I still don't fully understand that, and that's okay. It's going to happen, and that's okay. Uh, I don't want you to feel like you're stupid or there's anything wrong with you. It happens to all of us. Uh, so focus on the whole of the prophets and instead of fitting all the details into a certain system. I know uh, you see a lot of televangelists do that kind of stuff, and it, it's not overly helpful. Wisdom is the last section of the Old Testament. And as you can see, the Old Testament has a lot of complexity to it. It's one of those books that you can never really get bored of, I think. And the main, uh, the main idea of wisdom is it calls for us to think and reflect, not, simply dire- uh, not simple and direct like the law. The law said, do this and don't do that, right? But in the wisdom, it tells us, think which is, I think, a lot harder to do. Um, it gives The wis- wisdom books give insights, but not universal promises. Um, it, it's, it, they, they focus on the practical. Uh, a good example of this would be um, in Proverbs. It says, hey, if you work hard, you're not going to be in poverty. But then, as a missionary, you might go to Ethiopia and see Christians working hard and paying tithes and doing all the right thing, but then still dealing with famine, dying, not having enough, being in a really big pickle, and those Proverbs aren't going to mean a whole lot to them. But the book of Job, where the righteous are suffering, that might mean a whole lot more to them. See what I mean? So it's one of those things where, where, where wisdom is more something you have to think about. It's not a universal promise. Uh, it's just a call to think. Now, wisdom can be broken up into different sections. We're going to say the first one is Proverbs. Proverbs is the basic life wisdom. This is how, generally speaking, you should live. They're Par- I'm sorry, proverbs that are proven true over time. They're not always true, but generally speaking, they are true. Um, so then we get to the rest of the books of wisdom are exceptions to the rule. Proverbs is the rule. All the other wisdom books are exceptions. Exception number one, well, why do righteous people suffer? Proverbs says, hey, if you do this, everything's going to go good. But then uh, Job says, oh, yeah, Job did all the right things and he still suffered. So that would be the first exception. Um, and I, I, with that being said, uh, sometimes people suffer without reason. Sometimes you're going to have all the wisdom in the world. It's not going to be enough. You're going to be in a situation you don't understand. There's no way to get a straight answer. And that's what all of his friends and even Job and part of it don't understand is they're all working on this premise that I can analyze a situation, I can use wisdom, and I can resolve it. But that wasn't true in the situation. And his friends didn't get that, and he didn't get that. So they're arguing and trying to figure out the solution to the dilemma, and they never figure it out. God never enlightens them as to what's actually going on. God never explains about how Satan was at work. He never explains about how he was at work. He never explains any of it. He never gives Job back his dead children. He gives him more children, but those dead children were still dead. And as somebody who's lost a child before... That's a world of pain that Job had to carry with him for the rest of his life. Yes, he did get more children, yes, but it's not like, you know, uh, a candy when you're a kid. Like, oh, I lost my Twizzler, but at least I still have my, my uh, Snickers. Like, it's, they're not interchangeable. And uh, so they did, there was this pain that he still had to live with. But Job typically talks about, or not typically, but by and large, talks about the idea of why do righteous people suffer, which is a big life question I think people really ask a lot. Um, the next exception to the rule uh, is the book of Ecclesiastes. So Proverbs says, okay, here's the basic life wisdom, but then Ecclesiastes comes out of left field and says, well, rationality can't really provide meaning. You, you're not, 
You're not going to, wisdom's not going to get you to, get you to happiness. And so Ecclesiastes look at, looks at a second big life question. What is the point of life? These two questions are huge questions that people still ask today. These are, these are timeless questions, I would say. Um, but obviously Ecclesiastes has a cynical tone. If you're going to read Ecclesiastes, remember a cynical tone. Uh, then the last of the, of the books of wisdom is Song of Songs, and it's the third exception to the rule. And, that's, and, and the idea is that love is often irrational. Song of Songs talks about the irrationality of married love. Um, it's, uh, by the way, Song of Songs is the same, same, of song, sang, same as Song of Solomon. Song of Songs just means the greatest of songs. Uh, and Proverbs tells us what kind of a man to marry, right? But Song of, song, song of Solomon tells us ir- the irrationality of love. <laughs> I, I know people always talk about how there's a whole chapter in Pro- Proverbs about what women should be, you know, the wife of the wife of the character. And then why isn't there a chapter for men? You aren't paying attention. The 30 chapters were about men. <laughs> the 31, 30, that one chapter all by itself, that's that's the one about women. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so don't think that, that Proverbs has nothing to say to men. It has a lot to say about men. Um, so... Uh, all the books of uh, books of wisdom use poetry throughout. So once again, just remember those things I was mentioning about poetry, and you'll be able to figure them out. Um, in Song of Solomon, you're going to have a lot of emotion. In Proverbs, you're going to have a lot of ration. So they're going to be two opposites of the spectrum. Job, by its nature, is probably going to be more emotional. Uh, Ecclesiastes is kind of kind of going to be in between emotional and rational, and uh, that's good. Generally speaking, if you work hard, you will prosper, but not always. I already mentioned that in the example from Ethiopia. Uh, Job is oftentimes going to be hard to understand, and it calls for a lot of reflection. Um, You have Job broken up into areas. uh, The beginning is is Job is afflicted, and then there's this long, drawn-out section about a search for an answer, and then the end part is God answering. Um, And there was this idea back then that if you suffer, it's because you did something wrong. And Job so shows us that's not true. Uh, wisdom is obviously going to be of limited value. Wisdom was obviously of limited value to Job and his friends, um, it, but it asks a lot of questions that I think we can still learn from. Is God just? Um, you don't under, understand everything. You don't always have answers. It, it's better to just simply listen and not come to it with the idea of "I know." There was actually a guy who told my who told my dad. You, you, guys, you guys get a kick out of the story. Um, There's this guy that told my dad. He said. After after my mom passed, he said, "You know, I, I think I, I think I know what you're going through because I, I lost my dog a couple of weeks ago." <laughs> like, what do you respond to that? So, uh, uh, well, my I think my dad did a pretty good job of it. He uh, almost said something that he shouldn't have, and almost did something with the, with his hands that he shouldn't have. But instead, he just called the guy an idiot and walked away. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow. <laughs> Good self-control, because I tell you what, if my wife had died and somebody had said that, I think I'd be a little bit less less rational, but whatever. Uh, so kudos to my dad, who was actually able to walk away. Huh? <laughs> uh, but that's a good example. People always say when somebody's going through trouble, I know what it's like. No, you don't. Everybody's going through something different, and they all handle it differently, right? The same water that boils the egg, well, you get, you get it. And then different people can experience different things at different levels. And so the thing that we can learn from Job largely is, listen. Don't have answers, just listen. Don't go to it with, hey, I know. Go to it with, okay, let me, let me try and understand. Um, you, can, you, can, you can objectively understand how something feels, but you can't really know what it feels like until you've gone through it. Um, so <clears throat> always look at suffering. When you're looking at the book of Job, look at suffering in light of the New Testament's teachings. Things will get hard all around. We've looked at, at that quite a bit in Sunday, on Sunday mornings. A um, few last things. Let me make sure I didn't forget anything here. Since this is the last class, I really want to make sure I wrap up all the loose ends. Uh, Ecclesiastes, I already mentioned, uh, you could say its summary is what is the point of life. Uh, the world doesn't contain key. It goes through all, all the different things that we typically draw purpose from in life, money and, 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 and all, those, all those different things, prestige and everything. Um, so, uh, And then he s- kind of summarizes at the very end of Ecclesiastes by saying a very simple statement. Uh, when all things are considered, fear God and obey him. And I think that would be the, the summarizing idea of it. Uh, Song of Songs is, is a book broken up into three sections. The, the first part is the courtship, the middle part is the wedding, and the third part is just their life together. Um, if you read the book, you're going to find that the woman does the most of the talking. No sarcasm here meant. 
Okay, I'm not saying a quip about women. I'm simply saying in the Book of Song of Solomon, the woman does most of the talking. And I'm moving on from there. Uh, and <laughs> uh, obviously, Song of Solomon is not going to have much for you if you are single. Um, that's just the way of it. I know that all of the Bible is, is inspired and everything, but if you're single and you're, not, and you're planning on staying single, there's really not much you can get from the book. Uh, it's more about married love. I highly encourage married people to read it more than they do, but um, if you're single, uh, I'm, I just really wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, wh- some of the things we can learn from Song of Solomon, remember why you got married in the first place? Uh, and this is something that's talked about in Proverbs and Song of Solomon. Why shouldn't you be satisfied with your wife? If you think about cheating or divorcing or anything like that, just stop and ask yourself the question, well, why, why shouldn't I be satisfied with my wife? Because we're getting in fights, you're going to get that with anybody. I mean... Uh, you know, it, 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 it says it in a lot more of a blunt way. I believe it's in Proverbs. It says, always be satisfied in the, in, the, in the breasts of your wife. And the idea here is don't cheat on somebody else because someone else is more attractive or whatever. It's, it's, not, it's not a competition. You know, I think this is one of the effects of porn being so strong in our, in our culture is that it, we're constantly unsatisfied, constantly looking for something better. But there's a certain pleasure that can only be found in staying faithful to the person you married. It's something that, that, that nobody can tell you about. You just have to experience it for yourself. And um, so instead of saying, why shouldn't I cheat, why should you cheat? <laughs> why do you have to cheat with another woman when your wife is, there's nothing wrong with your wife? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so that is the end of the class. Uh, it's, I think, um, I think this study is probably what changed it most for me when I was um, trying to learn the Bible for myself. Um, do you have any questions or comments about Bible study? Anything that you didn't quite understand or I didn't clarify good enough? Anything that you want to know before we close out the class? This is the last night. No, so we're all good? Okay, remember, just keep studying. Answers will, com- answers will come in time. Okay? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together. I pray you'd bless everyone uh, who was in this class, that you would help them to um, really grasp your word and help them to understand it fully. Uh, help them and show that you would show them, show them new things that they'd never seen before, that they would be hungry for your word, and that uh, they would read it as a, as, as a regular part of their day, that as they're going through it, they would get a Bible that they understand, they would really comprehend what is being said, um, and that they would, uh, they, they would uh, apply it to their lives. They would, they, would, they would stick with it as a, as a book, but then they would also go beyond just simply a book and, and follow it and allow it to change them. Um, help us not to become masters of your word, but students of it. Help us not be, to become people who correct your word, but rather... Uh, who who pay attention to your word and give us a, a humble uh, disposition that as we read the Bible, we can we can come with this, I don't know everything and, and, and I need to be changed. Not I need to change the Bible, but I need to be changed. And Lord, we love you. Uh, help us to have a good rest of the week. Amen.